Well, Uraraka, is it finally time for your first victory? Well, I wait and watch in anticipation. Before we have this review of chapter 323 of My Hero Academia, please be sure to leave your own that's on the chapter in the comment section down below. Leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, make sure you hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Now, let's get into it. What's up guys, I got Pencil here, and here we are to review chapter 323 of My Hero Academia, which is known as One Step. And I like this chapter, but at the same time, it feels like this chapter was almost bogged down by something, but at the same time, there's something that got me super interested, and at the same time, you know what, simple and short, it's complicated, so let's hop right into it. So we see that the idea of Midoriya coming back was still a contentious topic. Uh, the flashback we got a few chapters ago, where we got to see Yue convincing Endeavor to give them the GPS and stuff like that, and Nezu saying Midoriya is allowed to come back whenever he wants, he's still allowed to be a student here, it wasn't as simple as it first seemed, and we see that they're deliberating the viability of bringing Midoriya back. Ida believes that Midoriya coming back alone should be enough confidence for the civilians to be like, I guess we'll hold that, because Midori is their best asset. He's obviously the only one who could fight one for all, or at least one for all. I keep I like, I like, keep flipping those two in my head, and when it comes out of my mouth, it comes out as one for all rather than all for one. But Midori is the only asset against all for one, considering everyone else is too weak, so bringing him back safely should be enough to be the civilians like hope, like their guiding light, that with a hero that can actually protect them there, they should be a lot safer than they were before with just the UA's defense barrier. Because Ida doesn't believe in the UA defense barrier, and to be fair, I don't blame him. And the thing is, Nezu tries to hype it up by saying UA boasts the greatest defensive technology in the whole nation, its security is comparable to the defensive capabilities of Tartarus. And then, I'll give the characters credit, Yarozu, one of our smart characters, I'm proud of her, brings up a fantastic point. Tartarus got body bagged by a weakened Shigaraki, and a whole bunch of Nomu admittedly, but still a weakened Shigaraki. And of course it was a two-pronged attack from the inside and from the outside, and that's where we're going to get into like the whole traitor dynamic we want to talk about again. But regardless of that, she brings up a fantastic point that we have seen these kind of defenses fail. We've seen this level of defense, the Tartarus level defense, crumple between a being as powerful as all for one Shigaraki while he was extremely battle damaged. So, we get to see that UA is now upgraded to a degree that's slightly different than Tartarus, but at the same time is just as viable defensively. And that sort of comes in the way of the UA defensive barrier being mobile. And I did mention in the last chapter reviews, and like, I think a couple chapter reviews before that, that if the UA barrier was able to fly, then maybe be something against Shigaraki, because, you know, he couldn't just, like, touch the ground and then bada-bing, bada-boom, 15 miles away, everything gets destroyed, because, you know, Decay just works on anything it touches now. Like, it'll just expand endlessly as long as Shigaraki needs it to. But now we get to see that UA can move essentially underground. It's almost like a... Is it weird to call it a worm? Like, it can burrow its way through the ground in a multiple variety of areas, and it's even split up into multiple smaller areas, which allows it to, like, swap around and move. Like, there'll be, it'll be like a cart system underground, very akin to, like, a subway station or something like that. Like, each part of UA is its own individual subway car, and they'll all go in different directions. Stuff like that. Or at least not even subway car, but trains. I think that is interesting. And while it does seem to be good and i feel like the multiple metal plates are meant to like protect against decay i feel like they're forgetting the properties of how decay works i think unless i'm mistaken these metal plates aren't like hovering apart from each other like these 3000 steel plates they're still all very able to like they're not even very able to. They're touching each other. They're metal plates. Obviously, for them to move, they have to be linked. I don't think Nezu mentions anything here about, like, them being magnetized or something, so the only thing connecting them is, like, I don't know, like, their magnetic pole or something like that. This is simply metal plates being attached on each other, like, on top of rolling steel orbs, and they'll react to any disturbances and stuff like that, so the defense system will activate. But the thing is, all Shigaraki still needs to do, at least from my perspective. Now, once again... I have been proven many times wrong before. Thank you, all of you in the comment section. Whenever y'all call me out on something, I appreciate it. I can't read things perfectly. And obviously, this isn't the official translation, so maybe the official translation will include this up better. But unless I'm mistaken, what Nezu describes here isn't a strong enough defense against Shigaraki specifically. Because as long as things are connected and as long as Shigaraki keeps his quirk active, aka touching something, and even then, he doesn't have to continuously touch something. It'll spread like the plague. 
this isn't going to be enough. I mean, the UA defensive barrier could be fast. It could be speedy. It could be speedy Gonzalez. But I don't think it's going to work out because of how fast Shigaraki is. And saying that the 3,000 metal plates are, like, magnetized and hover apart from each other. We got to realize that Decay isn't the only thing Shigaraki has right now. And I keep describing it as Shigaraki, even though it should be all for one. Controlling Shigaraki, which is even worse, honestly. But all for one slash Shigaraki slash whatever you want to call him is a demon. That man is super strong. And like 3,000 steel plates, who knows? That may have been too much for all my back in the day. But considering that Shigaraki is quote of like, well, not Shigaraki, but Shigaraki's body is sort of like an all my level threat. Like, I feel like even the 3,000 steel plates and how fast they move, it cannot be comparable to what Shigaraki can do, either with the K alone or with his raw physical strength. And we got to realize that all of Shigaraki's Nomu enhanced body's physical strength wasn't like the quirk mutation super blah, 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 that all for one had to do against All Might in their final battle. It was legitimately just Shigaraki being so gosh darn swole, having such dense muscle fibers that he was able to just swing and throw around. Like he was a monster before he was even completed. Man, was at what, like 60, 70%? So I feel like at full power, this defense system still isn't adequate. And to be fair, it's unreasonable for me to assume this defense system would be adequate ever like nezu would literally have to say oh we can move at like the speed of light and beyond or something like that to stop shigaraki because i don't know shigaraki doesn't seem like a threat that can be stopped by technology right now i know it seems weird but like i don't think there's anything that like man could produce to stop shigaraki considering shigaraki was produced by man to specifically destroy everything like on a physical metaphysical go on however many layers you want to go into that you can go way into that from his character to blah 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 blah, blah. but the thing is on the simple de on the simple defense aspects of the UA defense barrier on its own i don't think it's viable enough and i think it could even lead to something worse like what if the system fails and by fails i mean we know the metal plates will respond in case something goes wrong but what if they fail after Shigaraki attacks them? Say, like, he starts using Decay, and somehow, due to blah blah blah, the Decay doesn't work. What if he just punches the ground really, really hard? And all the delicate systems, I assume these are delicate systems, or maybe they're reinforced, whatever. But these systems that cause everything to move when and where, I feel like that could be very easily disrupted by enough force and jostling. Like, like Momo said, Tartarus was an adequate defense both on the inside and on the outside, but it didn't stop them from destroying it because of the raw power that was coming through. I don't know. I'm hoping the defense barrier isn't just something that's getting hyped up for nothing. I hope it isn't a safety rug that Horikoshi is putting us on like he's done in the past. He's just going to yank it out from under us and be like, oh no, are you surprised? Haha, -ha, the defense barrier hyped up didn't work. It's fine, Horikoshi. You hyped up things like this before and they haven't worked in the past. But Honestly, this brings up an entirely different angle of something that I was interested in, and that is the idea that Nezu could be the traitor. Now, Oceanus is a guy who talks about My Hero Academia a lot, and I, who I respect deeply because he's changed a lot of my views on My Hero Academia. He has a much more positive spin on the series, and recently he released a video talking about how the My Hero Academia traitor plotline is basically dead, because it hasn't been mentioned in forever. However, his video brought up a point that I think is interesting. And I think it's the idea, I may be misremembering this, because I haven't watched the video in a while. I sort of watched it when it first came out, and I was like, oh, cool. And then, like, sat in the back of my head, then I read this chapter, and something Nezu said that caught my eye. It was, he, when he notes that, the, well, after explaining that Shiketsu is somehow connected, and they have their own similar defense barrier, and that he's paid for all this, which is impressive, Nezu got bank, okay, I see you, Nezu. He mentions that all, no, it's not that he mentions it, Tokoyama mentions that all these countermeasures and all this stuff doesn't make sense. Like, this doesn't seem like something you would predict, and this obviously isn't something you just recently built. This would take ages to build. What, you, how did this happen? Like, what did you do? What did you know? And Nezu brings up a point that there was absolutely no evidence back then. It was purely my intuition. And for some reason, that, like, struck a chord in my mind. I was like, like, as I was reading this chapter early in the morning, my brain said, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't, like, that's not foresight that's knowledge like you know what i mean like i don't care how high spec nezu is at but I, it seemed like something wrong was with that statement like it was purely my intuition and the thing is unless i'm mistaken unless my domer is a little bit slow which to be fair i am not the sharpest spoon in the kitchen shed that scene that we flash back to is the scene that introduces the ua trader i'm pretty sure that's when president mike speaks up about it and we never really did get an answer to how villains knew so much. But wouldn't it be convenient 
if the principal, the person who would know everything about where the students are going to be, ended up being the traitor. And for very like understandable reasons, we never risk necessarily know where Nezu got that scar from. We just know it came from his experimentation. And I've heard different theories about Nezu that Nezu was like a high functioning gnome or something like that. But I feel like it'd be even more interesting if Nezu was just like, I don't know. He did it himself like not that he was like he was the secret puppet behind all for one all this time or he was like an extended consciousness of all for one but say that nezu was an animal being experimented on who was saved by all for one and all for one gave him high spec just because he was like eh, what happens if i give an animal this quirk and he just gave him the quirk and then nezu going through trauma was like well it's time to play the long game against this world and he ended up slowly working his way up in the world, acquiring money, acquiring power, ended up doing all this only for in the most desperate moment when they needed someone like him most, a leader who could defend them, he turns on them because he despises humans, because they're greedy, they're deceitful, they're monsters in a sense, and we see that later in this chapter. But of course, that's me making massive leaps and assumptions, I just want to bring that up because it's something that clicked in my head for some reason. It was the recent Oceanus video that talked about the dead traitor plotline, and then of course it was just like this weird line from Nezu that he somehow managed to predict everything and built a system that he controls, assumedly, I don't think this is like a multifaceted control system, this is an automatic thing that he built, he paid for it all, so he knows all the specs to it, be a shame if he managed to turn around and be like oh bada bing bada boom looks like the system doesn't work looks like all for one you can just kill all you civilians what a shame my bad and i know aoyama is like the big trader suspect right now but who says there couldn't be more than one trader like a student trader and a faculty trader because hmm? 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 i don't blame y'all i remember that aoyama art and i do believe that is very it's big trader energy <laughs> i'm not gonna lie because i feel like it couldn't be anything else if that's just like a picture of aoyama rec rep whoa if that's just a picture of aoyama representing like the students of ua and like the monster of all for one sneaking through their closet and looking upon them knowing everything they're going to do i feel like that's aoyama wouldn't be used for that so that definitely seems like trader bait but I don't know, at the same time, Nezu just threw me off this chapter, I'm not gonna lie. Also, like, weird artistic man coming out again. The, is it me or does Nezu get drawn, 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 oh my, does Nezu get drawn more cartoony than ever before? I don't know, my man like just threw me off, built like a whole cartoon, built like a knockoff Mickey Mouse. I know that's kind of what he was supposed to be from Rip, but I don't know, he had a much more like rotund figure to him now. It looks like my man lost weight, a lot of his, a lot of his proportions became more cartoons and the, the cart, cartoon they became more cartoons they became more cartoonistic and less like i don't know but to be fair everyone's an eye has changed from the beginning of the series so i shouldn't just i don't know it just threw me off but that's just because i'm noticing it right now i feel like it was like that for a while now but i just never noticed but the thing is we get to see that all these people back at the school are still like, yo, Midoriya, we do not want that boy. Keep that man out of here. He is not the one. Not today, buddy. And I love how Midoriya, well, to be fair, man still is like a whole hero at heart. So he's not really going to fight to leave or not fight to stay. That's what I mean. He's not going to fight to stay. So like you can tell like in this shot of Uraraka when she looks like a cat for some reason. I don't know. The way Horikoshi drew her there made me straight up see like a whole cat Uraraka and don't do anything. with. I mean, y'all fan artists out there, I won't stop you, but I just don't do anything with it. And regardless of that, we had to see that Midori, he's like half term ready to leave hearing about them like yelling. And to be fair, I bet Uraraka is like holding his wrist like, don't you leave you idiot and we get to see that everyone is like the misinformation has spread so much that everyone's like confused they're getting mixed up stuff like that like they asked if all for one's a type of no moon and stuff like that and they are and to be fair i can't even really blame oh, see horikoshi horikoshi is very good at making me question humanity like that's a weird thing to say but it makes me Horikoshi, through this incident, made me question, yo, if I was in the same situation as these civilians, would I be reacting the same way? Would I want a person who seems to be in a similar situation to all for one, aka he has multiple quirks, he seems extremely dangerous, and it seems to be the target of the big bad who wants to kill us all, would I really be comfortable with letting him in? Like, on the events of one, if I don't know anything, like, this is just some boy that I know for a fact all for one is after, and if he's here and all for one learns that he's here, he's gonna come jeopardize my safety. Would I be fine with letting him in? Like, taking yourself out of the perspective of a reader of My Hero Academia, someone who knows Deku personally, someone who's watched Deku grow and stuff like that, do you believe that in the situation where your own safety, based on the, all the information you have and the misinformation and the chaotic situation, do you believe your humanity? 
or mainly the kindness of your humanity would hold up? Do you believe you'd be willing to sacrifice your own safety for one boy that you don't know anything about? He just seems to be a target for the big bad villain who's destroying the world. Do you think it would hold up? Because honestly, while I may not be screaming, don't let him in, don't let him in, I would probably be shaken. I probably would be shook. Like if, if this man or this boy, I guess, who I don't know anything about, is this much of a threat to my safety i'm not sure i'd be all that cool with letting him roll on in here like a lot of us are definitely not agreeing with these people because we know midori and stuff like that and we understand the situation fully like we have all the information relevant to make a like it's weird to say the proper choice but the proper choice and we haven't been through the scenario they've been through where they've been betrayed by the heroes and stuff like that and all this information has been hidden from them they haven't gone through that well, no, we haven't gone through that. They're in their own unique situation, so I sort of understand their point. Horikoshi, you mad, but he's so good at what? <sighs> See, I do believe Horikoshi has some problems when it comes to writing. I think he writes too fast. I think sometimes he writes too slow. There's like so many things that I could go on endlessly about Horikoshi's writing, but I don't want to bog down this review. However, I will say, I've said it, I can't even say I've said it once. I've said it like 50,000 times. I'm going to keep saying it. Horikoshi is very, very good at writing realistic people or a realistic group of people, like a realistic society. This feels like a human reaction on the most basic level of, oh no, I want to survive. Keep the thing that's probably gonna jeopardize my survival away from me. I completely understand where the people are coming from, even if from my perspective as a reader, it seems unreasonable. And I love how interspersed between this screaming of all their fear and their concern, we get to see the people that Midoriya is connected to personally. We get to see his mother, we get to see Eri, and I don't know, Monoma isn't really connected to him, but still, we get to see Eri, we get to see Koda, we get to see all these people who genuinely care. And we also get to see that despite what the heroes say, like best genius himself, a beloved hero before this whole mess, like someone who was greatly loved by the public, top three hero, was someone who would have a lot of sway, maybe, I'm not sure how long the time skip has been, like said, let's just say six months ago, someone who would have had a lot of strength in these people's hearts is the one who gets rejected extremely quickly. Like they all say, after Best Genius goes through this deep, proper explanation of why they need to have Midoriya here, he's the only fighting force, he's the one who's been out there and we need him to come back and be rested or else if All For One shows up right now, we have nothing to do to stop him. That's it. They don't care because they are scared they're filled with fear and you can damn and like i'm not sure about you but i can understand that and i can see that reaction coming out of people that is definitely a reaction i could see and i know it seems mean i know it sounds bad but this is real i, I don't know like if given the context of a situation like this i completely understand that and we get to see that he despite midoriya's whole situation being explained as the one weapon that can properly take on all for one he, one man it's interesting how all it takes is one person who doesn't agree he talks about how japan has went into an era of chaos because of the failure of the heroes and now due to the failure of said heroes regardless of what would be the best situation for everyone heroes included it doesn't matter because they have failed and now they just want the best situation for themselves and thus they do not want Midoriya here. It's interesting. Oh my. Oh, gosh. Okay, never mind. I take back what I said at the beginning. Of no, I don't because I don't think. That we're ah. Horikoshi, you are like one of the few people that can actually make me cons. Like, you're making me go through character arcs as I review your gosh darn chapter. But regardless of that, we get to see that the idea of heroes as these perfect idealistic symbols is still rooted in their heads despite them knowing for the fact that it's not that. Like, I love how they seem to like have this concept of heroes being these endless superhuman war machines that can just never stop. They forget that heroes are people, despite they know that any person reasonably can become a hero. It's interesting how due to constant pushing up, constant like setup from the society, the hero commission, all these people, all this stuff has led to a situation where heroes are viewed as lesser than people. They're viewed as beings who can't be allowed to rest, who can't be allowed to recover, and just simply must protect the civilians because that's what heroes do, right? That's all heroes are allowed to do. And if they ever were to do anything else, that would be wrong. That wouldn't make them heroes. That'd be horrible. I, 
I love how this has affected them, and I love how chaotic it is. Like these, these people become monsters because they aren't all no. <sighs> The anxiety and the fear becomes the monster that overtakes these people. You can see all these heroes almost cower back in fear. Like, we get to see present Mike, Midoriya himself. I love how all, like, the, the paneling is here is beautiful too. The sparking rays of the people's hatred and malice and anger and fear. It's all, like, tearing apart the panel itself, causing those lightning strikes. And we get to see that Midoriya, the, the center of all of this, he's receiving all that lightning himself. Like, it's all channeling onto him. And you can see the fear in his eyes. And you can see by the blank... All, the blank screaming of these civilians and the crying and the pain of everyone it's like slowly going to break Midori it's going to break everyone even President Mike is scared he says this is no good and I'll give Uraraka credit she leaps to the heavens and she is the one who apparently managed to snatch the whole microphone from his hand and like the swiftest motion too that was clean that was a clean swipe but we get to see she has risen to the heavens and I guess they're all outside I was wondering if they were outside, but why are y'all standing outside? <laughs> like, what if all for one, just air walking through that? Well, to be fair, he gave up air walk to Lady Nagat. So maybe he doesn't have that. Anymore. But he could have given her a copy. Mmm, he could have given her a copy. So he could have air walk. But imagine if Shigaragi was just like levitating above even higher than our rock was like, wow, that's a shame, ain't it? Y'all going wild, ain't it? Well, time to die. Like, all y'all decided to stand outside for some reason in the rain. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. But regardless of that, we get to see Aravity. Uraka has finally decided to take a stand and she's the one who's going to convince these people that Midoriya needs to be allowed in because he has a special power. He is the person who left Yue to protect all of them. He knows what they're thinking. Like he, <laughs> She's legit going over the fact that Midoriya did leave initially. The reason he's not coming back is not just because he's tired. One, because he's like almost dead. But two, it's because he is not only needed there to defend them because he has the special power which was meant to beat all for one the one thing that's meant to stop him but on top of that he is welcome back or he needs to come back because he left to protect him in the first place but that obviously is not working and we get to see that the people due to their idealization of heroes despite how much they hate them now has affected them they haven't really looked at Midoriya they don't see how much pain the man is in and I think that's almost, it's, it's beautiful, I don't know, I like it, I like it, I know it's like bad for Midori, but I think this is great to see, and what I love to see even more than that, is that Uraraka is allowing herself to sort of take on the burden of the people, and we get to see that some of these people are the people that Midori himself has saved in the outside world, the one girl from Two Chapters Back is the one who was saved by Midoriya. And I like how this is sort of the humanization of heroes. Through Uraraka, she's sort of reminding people that people are heroes just as heroes are people. Like, heroes are still human. They need to rest. They need to be like this. They need to eat. They need to sleep. They aren't just war machines. And Bakugo, shut up about the security system. It's not even valid. But... <laughs> And the thing is, we get to see Bakugo, I don't know, Bakugo always has the weirdest things to say in some of the translations. Like, the fan translations, I'm not gonna lie, he has one of some of the weirdest things to say, because, like, if you can't wipe something, leave yourself to wipe it for you. Are you talking about their butt? Like, what, what the heck, Bakugo? I'm not sure about that. But regardless, we get to see that Uraraka is taking the first step. And Nezu believes that taking the first step is always hard, but I know taking a step like this will lead to the birth of a true hero, one that will surpass All Might. And I know, that does, that does seem like something Nezu wouldn't say like that wouldn't be his inner monologue if he was like a traitor but I just don't trust Nezu then that 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 intuition line still throws me off however the thing that we don't get to see is how the civilians react Uraraka is still fighting the civilians on like the mental level I think that's very very important now Horikoshi let me level with you real quick as a person who wants to like Uraraka I said it again. No, I said it. I, said, I messed up the phrase. I said it in the past, and I'll say it again. I want to like Uraraka. Please, I'm begging you, as a potential Uraraka fan, as someone who wants to like Uraraka, please give her this victory. Please, let this be the moment where Uraraka is finally allowed to be a hero in some sense of the word. I'm begging you. I'm legitimately, I, I'm not getting down. 
anywhere because I don't know where you are, so I cannot even bow to beg to you. However, I am asking you through my words, please give her this victory because this is something she needs. If you do not want to give her any combat victories, if you do not want to give her any major moments, if you do not want to give her anything, please don't let this moment just be another dud. Do not. I'm begging you. And then maybe, then maybe you can flip her a rock around and we can start liking it. Well, not we. I can start liking it because I know a lot of y'all like her a rock. And that's great. That's great. If you like her a rock already, don't ignore everything I said. In fact, it'll just be another moment for y'all, which is even better. I think that's great. Over for me, I'm just waiting. And I think it's very suspicious that Horikoshi sort of blocked off half the chapter for something we didn't even need to care about, considering the UA defense barrier was already hyped up. That's whatever. But I do think... Uh, Regardless, let me just focus on Uraraka for now. I do believe this is the point where Uraraka could do good. And I hope she does good. Because I would greatly appreciate it if she did good. So Horikoshi, I beg of you. Make Uraraka, let this be Uraraka's first major victory as a character. If you really want to start turning around her character. And I simply wait to see what you do. That's just me. Uraraka, you're up next. It's your turn. Now, for the rest of the chapter, what would I rate this chapter? I like part of me wants to give it an 8 out of 10 because I do not care about the OA defensive barrier. Mainly because I think it's just another red herring. Not a red herring. Uh, I've complained about Horikoshi's writing before that he writes in a very much, uh, oh, the, he, he, he very much likes to put up rugs. Just like he puts us on rugs that he likes to yank out from under us. However, like my foot is already halfway off the rug. So it doesn't surprise me that much. He's done this many times before. Every time there's been stakes, <laughs> that like could possibly end up bad for our characters it's never worked out so like this ua defense barrier being hyped up so much if it gets blown through immediately i wouldn't even be surprised if it actually ends up being useful then i'll be surprised then i'll be proud but right now that doesn't even matter to me so i believe that part of the chapter sort of drags it down like the whole explanation of it doesn't at least to me and notably my rating on the chapter will rise if one of y'all can legitimize it for me in the comment section down below but the way nezu describes it doesn't seem to imply that it's immune to decay. It doesn't seem to imply that it's immune to Shigaraki's raw physical power. It doesn't imply that it's immune to the who knows how many Nomu Shigaraki slash Awful One is in control of right now. It doesn't seem to imply any of that. So I don't know how this defense barrier is going to do, but hopefully it do good. But outside of that, I don't know. That's the thing. That's the, that's the drag the chapter down. Because while the interest of Nezu sort of throws me off, if I remove that, say I don't even give that any credit, I sort of come to the idea that... Half this chapter was kind of a waste. I would have preferred to just immediately see Uraraka hop in this hero role and see the people's reaction to that. Though I think the people's reaction... Mm, I'm going to give the chapter an 8 out of 10. Uh, that's what I'm going to give the chapter. Because so much in this chapter is like, ah, chef's kiss writing. Like, honestly, the realism of the humanity to the reactions to the situation, all of that, all of that seems very, very good. The way that the hero, the society has built up heroes in their mind, all that structure with the society in general and the people and all the different painful human reactions we get to see from the characters we actually know, great. I love that. The possible hints to any sort of traitor thing. I like that, even if the plot line may just be dead at this point. I like all of that. However, the whole it's just like a mecha anime stuff like the the defense barrier explanation seems pointless i'm not gonna lie but that's it that's it does that seem worth dragging the chapter down for two points i'd say so just because it is legitimately like a hard half of the chapter like it legit just is a whole half chunky boy of the chapter that seems completely un unimportant or at least not to me at least to me it seems unimportant you already hyped up the way defense barrier it's super good that's all you had to say I didn't, you didn't need to go into this super technical explanation that doesn't even seem like an explanation that's worthy enough of any protection against Shigaraki. But that's what I think. Please tell me what you, you guys think in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. And hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is That Guy the Pencil, writing off.